Hello, everybody. I'm Santiago, a second year PhD student at NYU. And I'll be presenting this paper on emitting commits and committing omissions. This work is basically about a design flaw that we found in Git. And I'm going to talk about how an attacker can uh, exploit this vulnerability, what can an, an attacker achieve when he exploits this vulnerability, how we fixed this vulnerability, and how these fixes have made their way into Git. Before moving forward, I'd like to introduce my collaborators, uh, Anil and Reza from NGIT, and Justin Kapos, my advisor. Before starting, I'd like to talk a little bit about the rules of the game. Maybe not all of us are familiar with uh, how Git works or what Git really is. So I'll uh, start with a story about a repository in the center at your left and two developers. You can see on your right hand side what's the state of the repository in the center, in the, in the, of the repository that's on the center. Now, Git is a distributed version control system. This means that every developer has their own copy of the repository as a local. This also means that every developer has their own perception of what the state of the central repository. When the first developer works, he commits locally and he performs some, change, some changes to the source code, and then he pushes the changes. This will add a new commit object to a new branch called feature that maybe will be pulled by the second developer, will be reviewed, and maybe merged into master. After the second developer pushes the changes into master, we see that the updated state of the repository has changes from both feature and master. Now, maybe the first developer wants to pull these changes, tag a release, and push the new tag for package maintainers and users to fetch the newest version of, Git, uh, of the software. Now, what I want to uh, emphasize is that these repositories can be compromised. While we were having uh, chips in Guacamole Tuesday night, someone was trying to actively break into a, the GitHub account of a developer for requests, which is a CA, well, a general uh, HTTP request framework that also handles CA uh, verification. Uh, I, I agree with them, and I quote that a crafty attacker, he says, a government or a powerful attacker could just sneak a little backdoor that would be then propagated into systems running in almost major tech corporation uh, and exploit them afterwards. Now, this is not the first, it hap uh, first time it happens. The Linux kernel was hacked. There was a man in the middle between China and GitHub, uh, between users in China and GitHub. The RubyGems was hacked. SourceForge was also hacked. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, FosHub was hacked and it deleted the MBR entries of many people. The Adobe was another major hack. The FSF was compromised. F Pro FTPD, Google, Red Hat. Now, I want to reiterate on this. Uh, compromises happen. Compromises on source code happen because they're really attractive to attackers. Now. Luckily, we have Git, and we have some, Git, uh, some security features with Git. The most uh, well-known is uh, hash chaining, right? Uh, if someone compromises a repository, they cannot uh, put changes far, that far down into the history and expect them to be propagated. It also means that if someone tampers with the commits, uh, the history will uh, fail to, tell, to, to verify. Now, we also have git commit uh, and tag signatures that prevent uh, attackers from creating new commit objects and new uh, tag objects. So every change in the history need, could be authenticated and attributed to a user. We also have uh, push certificates, which is a relatively recent addition. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. They're not so popular. I haven't seen them in production yet. However, things can go wrong. Uh, I'd like to show you how things can go wrong with an example. I was trying to install uh, Django 1.9.3 in my own modified uh, GitHub server, uh, GitHub uh, repository, and for some reason I ended up with Django 1.4.11. Uh, 
Interestingly, if you try to verify the tag, uh, GPG verification passes, so everything should be fine. But I'm actually running code that's, uh, that's valid code, right? If I ask for a little bit more detail, I realize that I'm actually getting the, right, uh, the wrong tag. I'm getting 1.4.11. Needless to say, Django 1.4.11 is uh, vulnerable for more than eight remote code execution vulnerabilities. And I also got the false impression that everything was uh, going smooth because GPG verification told me everything was fine. Now, what did this happen? Uh, let me introduce you to the problem then. The problem is that some Git metadata is not signed. If we run tree on the Git metadata folder, we'll see that some elements such as uh, objects, which are Git tags and Git commits, are actually signed. That's uh, what GPG, uh, GPG signing does. There's some other stuff, such as references, which are pointers to this uh, tag and commit object, which are not signed. This is our target. Now, an attacker with right access to the repository could be a malicious developer that doesn't wanna, uh, want to authenticate any actions, or it could be uh, someone who broke into a repository. Could modify this information and make it look, you know, and change the state of the repository into something that may, be, may cause unintended actions. Uh, of course, after these attacks are performed, it would look like a regular Git operation, so they're really, really subtle. Uh, with this knowledge and having seen that uh, these attacks can be performed just by slightly tweaking what's on the reference files, we came up with a metadata manipulation attack taxonomy. Uh, we found uh, a catalog of seven different uh, man metadata manipulation attacks. Uh, for in the interest of time, I'll only focus on the first three, which I think they will convey what exactly is happening with these things. And uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about the rest, you can, of course, read the paper. Now, let's go back to a central repository that's compromised. You see a little devil there. There's a buggy branch there that says do not merge. Maybe it's experimental code. Maybe it's Apple's duplicated go to. Uh, and someone is uh, asking the repository for, to know what's the state. Now, maybe the repository wants to equivocate then because it's malicious and will change the reference pointer that was originally in master to this do not merge branch. Of course, this will make the developer think that there's new changes upstream and actually Git will automatically merge this. After this happens, then we manage to trick the user into committing and signing a change that contains a vulnerable bug, a vulnerable piece of code into the production. Uh, analogous to the example that I gave you in the beginning of the talk, there's a tag teleport attack in which a reference is teleporting into another place in the history of Git. In this case, we have a tag that's known to be vulnerable. Think about Django 1.4.11. And we also have a version 1.1, which should be running smoothly, which should be trustworthy to some extent. Now, a developer wants to ins install version 1.1 because that's the trusted one or the non-vulnerable one. And uh, again, the server may want to equivocate. This uh, tag teleport attack simply uh, requires the attacker to move the pointer back into the previous tag. Of course, this will be installed, and most of the package managers in which we tested this simple attack uh, resulted in a clean installation of everything. Even in Conda, actually, you can ask it to verify GPG signatures. Um, anyway, in addition to this, there's other types of attacks. This is a rollback attack. A rollback attack uh, requires an, uh, well, will just be so that an attacker pulls back in the history, sort of like rewinding the movie into something old. Imagine there's a developer that just made a new feature that went through the code review and some bug was preemptively found by the developer that's a bug. Now, he committed, he committed the fix and he pushed into the feature branch, so the resulting uh, merge should not have the bug. It's fixed, right, by the uh, subsequent commit. However, an attacker could lie about this, who could rewind the branch, and upon merging, we have a vulnerable piece of code again in production. Now, 
this is pretty much what you can achieve with these kinds of things. Uh, it's a really simple attack. It's just tinkering with what's on the reference files. You could uh, present, uh, you could include the buggy code into production by tricking people into merging things. You could also make package managers or users or even gits of modules during initialization and include the vulnerable, p uh, vulnerable version of the code. You could also omit the security patch, like it was on the rollback attacks, and delete, uh, delete references and other things that may just result in annoyance. Now, seeing this, we, we and all of the team would try to find a way to fix this. We recognize that this is actually really similar to fork consistency attacks. Now, the problem is that we cannot use uh, for consistency attacks because of two main reasons. First of all, they try to, uh, for consistency systems most of the time try to create a consistent state of every single element within all of the repositories. The problem with this is that this doesn't play well with some distributed systems. Also, some other consistency systems assume that you will be able to call home every 30 seconds every 10 minutes, and if I, for example, wanted to write some code in the plane, then I cannot use a for consistency system. Now, given this, and given that Git is actually really smart in the way it synchronizes and identifies which elements are, are needed to synchronize, then we piggyback on Git. We also assume that uh, some like large uh, scale attacks, like four star attacks, are not a concern, because if you divide two groups of developers uh, separately, they will, if they don't see changes from each other, they will start wondering so that something's wrong. We've got, element, uh, we've got tools like mailing list, bug trackers, Slack, IRC, etc., that can let uh, developers coordinate from the outside. The trick here is that all of the attackers that I presented are actually temporary. They are reconcilable fork attacks. The state of the repository breaks and changes for five minutes at most or something. And then it comes back to a state in which everyone agrees that everyone, everything is fine. We also assume that the repository can be initialized at the root of trust. This is, although key management is uh, an issue and there's many clever solutions in how to handle this, we're assuming that uh, this can, be integrated, this can be integrated in our system, and actually we integrated uh, key management in our system in a really simplistic way. Now, without further ado, I'll introduce my solution. We'd like to, we have three main goals when we uh, thought of our solution. First of all, we wanted to preserve all of the Git workflows. This means that if someone is using Git send email to send a patch to a mailing list, that should work. Or if someone is using GitHub or GitLab or whatever, that should also work. This means that, you, that we cannot make assumptions in how people should use Git. We also align with uh, what's uh, Git's philosophy of uh, supporting older versions and backwards compatibility. Right now, if you are running a server with Git 2.9.4, you can talk with a server running 1.7.0 and vice versa. This means that we couldn't make any drastic or like disruptive changes into the way that Pack protocol worked. And we also want to provide the increased security in partial adoption scenarios. This is also a really realistic thing because by no one's, not everyone's going to use our solution at the offset. We introduce this and we'll eventually start providing greater benefits as people start using it. We also, uh, we also focused on these three uh, qualities that and we are sure that if we provide these qualities, then we are able to prevent these attacks and, many, and uh, ensure that the repository cannot equivocate on the metadata files. Now, if you see these three uh, characteristics, you'll see that preventing modification of committed data is actually provided by Git. Ensuring a, cons a consistent repository state is provided by something that we designed called a reference state log. And we also added something new that's called a non spec which will ensure that all of the, that the repository presents fresh information. Now, in the interest of time, I'll only focus on the reference state log. Uh, reference state log is a really, really simple protocol or addition to Git. 
instead of do, doing a regular push, which only sends the objects, this is what you should see here, uh, it, al it also pushes a signed statement that says, this is the references that I'm changing. This is what you should be seeing now. When these changes make it to the other side, then the objects are transmitted as they are usually done. And there's also some consistency uh, assurance that the references were changed by an authenticated user. Now, a reference state log is basically a series of RSL push entries. These RSL push entries contain really simple uh, information, which is what's the reference that's changing, like branch master, uh, what's the actual commit object in which the branch should be pointing to, uh, hash of the previous entries so that an attacker cannot remove uh, RSL push entries or cannot uh, change the ordering of the entries or anything of the like. And finally, a signature that authenticates the user uh, that made the, this a specific change. We then, with this really simple solution, we made a prototype. We did something uh, that's called uh, Git extensions. It's pretty much a, a script that you add to the path, and you can use it as you would use uh, any git push or git fetch operation. And we made it so that the reference state log lives on a separate branch in the, in a, as a special branch in the repository. This means that uh, we didn't change any of the protocol. We didn't uh, actually do anything weird to git. We just managed to send the, the RSL as, along with the regular push, uh, as long as you would write git secure push instead of git push. Now, synchronization is really easy. We, if we go back to the example from which I started in this uh, presentation, we had the, the developer worked and committed locally, and this time he'll do a git secure push. Instead of only having the feature branch added to the, to the repository, we also have a new commit that contains all of the information about this RSL entry. When the other developer does a secure, put, put, uh, secure pull or fetch, he'll be able to verify and ensure that all of the references are in the right place. Once the merge is done, that, that's what happened in our example before, and the push is uh, made back to master, and new RSL entry with a new state of the repository is pushed. When the other developer pulls, He'll be, uh, he or she will be sure that uh, the state of the references are correct. Now, verification is really simple you see, uh, on the RSL. We just want to be sure that all of the entries are uh, signed by a trusted party. We also want to make sure that the RSL uh, entries are linked together. This is just doing simple uh, hash chaining in the same way that Git does uh, right now. And also that the references are pointing in the right place. This is what we wanted to achieve in the first place, right? Now, with our prototype, we evaluate it and check whether our solution is practical and how, how much will it cost to provide these security guarantees to users of Git. We, uh, we basically checked that, the, uh, that our solution was proper. This means that we'll, if you want to perform any of these attacks, you would have to ha you have to have an attacker that contains a key that can authenticate the change in the RSL, or an attacker that could be able to present older versions of the RSL to a user. And that's why we added the nonce back. With the nonce back, none of the rollback attacks should happen, and the teleport attacks shouldn't happen with the RSL. Uh, with the teleport or deletion attacks shouldn't happen with the RSL push entries. We also explored and compared how our RSL and non here compares to other solutions. Push certificates are similar to the RSL in that they contain uh, similar fields, but they are not uh, changed together. And they also change the way that, uh, well, they extended the way that the PAC protocol works. So you have a bigger, well, you, you need a newer version of Git to be able to use push certificates. They also, since they do not have something that's equivalent to a nonce back, then rollback attacks and duplication attacks also ha oh, cannot be prevented either. Oh, something really important to notice is that also push certificates do not have a default distribution mechanism. This means that you may have to have a separate server or some other instance of something to be able to host and to distribute the push certificates to other users. We also uh, made sure that the partial adoption of our defense 
which is one of the goals is uh, is uh, achieved and we see that uh, although all of the attacks are possible we reduce the attack surface by only allowing commits after the latest RSL entry was made. This is similar to just reducing the number of ROP gadgets that someone can use. We also check the storage uh, size. In the right hand side of the, of the table, you see that most of the time this is under 1%. And this is actually less than what push certificates require. We also check the network overhead. It's less than 25 kilobytes. Uh, and it's doubled round trip time, but this is this will go away once the complete solution is part of the Git uh, pack protocol. Then we made all of this theory, and this is what like where usually uh, regular theory uh, paper ends. But we didn't stop there. We uh, uh, reached out to the Git community. We presented these uh, issues. And we started uh, working with them in order to fix what they call the low-hanging fruit first. We, ch we refactored the Git tag PGP verification code. You should be seeing these things in version 2.9.0. Uh, it was a really, really, well, the word is not painful, but really thorough uh, or like expensive and time-consuming uh, effort because they do care about their code. They will not let a single white space go through and the commit message must be perfect and non-ambiguous and everything should be fine. Uh, after eight iterations of the same six series, uh, batch series of six patches, I finally made it through. And now you have uh, pretty much all the groundwork for all these fixes to be there. We started uh, trying to fix the gay tag teleport attack, which is the simplest uh, attack to fix because there's already a header, an element in the git tag header that tells you which tag is this. So adding a simple uh, equality check should, is really simple. We also started exploring how to fix the rest of the things. And uh, we'll, it mo we'll, we'll mostly imply taking push certificates, which is their like, mature solution, and integrate them somehow into this uh, uh, non-SPAC RSL ideology uh, or like design constraints. We also started exploring if these attacks are possible in other version control systems. Uh, we realized that the BitKeeper doesn't support GPG signing, which was a, pretty, a little bit disappointing. Uh, but we also saw that Mercurial and Monotone support GPG signing to different extents. Actually, Monotone is mandatory. And uh, these two other version control systems do prevent uh, metadata manipulation attacks. This doesn't mean that they are not vulnerable to other types of attacks. This just means that you cannot tinker with the references and expect people to do unintended operations. Now, I'd like to wrap up with the following uh, takeaway points. First of all, first of all do not trust the infrastructure. Uh, if the repository is presenting you with this information, be sure that this is actually information that should be proper. For example, GitHub added the PGP verification service, but it could really lie to you, right? You should be really verifying all of this information locally with a keychain that you can trust. Now, GPG, uh, uh, GPG signatures on Git objects and tags is uh, currently not enough. This doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing that. Actually, it's way better than nothing. We also check whether signatures and everything was used on on popular repositories, and it seems that the usage is increasing, which is a really uh, good news. Also, do not use references for things like uh, cloning from uh, installing from using pip or something, uh, because these things can happen to you. But you should be uh, you should be using the SHA-1, which provides you a tight bound binding between what you want and what you uh, what you want and what you get. At it. Also, and also like update Git. There's also changes there that will make your life uh, better and easier. Uh, that's pretty much it. Questions? Uh, so no one understood anything <laughs> or <laughs> Uh, so I had a question while we're waiting to see if, if anyone else does. Uh, you mentioned that uh, use of signed commits is increasing. 
Yes. Do you, can you say anything more like, is it still fairly low? Or is it, is it uh, do you see it in the packages we would think are sort of most security relevant? Uh, so yeah, actually it's, it's interesting because uh, it depends on the community and actually the kinds of uh, people that use this uh, each uh, software. For example, the one that we found with the highest commit uh, rate was uh, Metasploit. They have a 70 something percent. And this is actually, it means that one in every four commits is signed, which means that if they are pushing uh, one in every four commits, the history is completely uh, proper. It cannot be tampered. We also saw that, for example, if you check the Linux kernel, there was pretty much no uh, signing whatsoever until about a year and a half ago. And now, be because it's hard to tell uh, which, push, which uh, commits are pushes and which are not, you, can, you will only see uh, certain signatures, mostly on merge commits, and actually done by Torvalds himself. This makes it so that you see less than 5% or something in the signing ratio, but it also doesn't provide a, like the complete picture, because if Torvalds is merging a patch set of 40 uh, different commits, then the signature for the merge commit actually applies to the 40 commits that are there. Hi, uh, Yujia Tam from Syracuse University. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering um, how you handle the freshness problem. Let's say Alice push version one and then she pushes version two later on. Um, Bob only wants to get the latest version. How can you ensure Bob gets version two rather than version one? Yeah, so this is handled by the addition that I didn't introduce in the talk. It's called the nonce pack. It's, uh, to keep it really simple, and we can talk a little bit more about it uh, after the talk, you put the random number into this nonce bag, and this will be used uh, to verify when you get the next version, uh, when you pull the next time. If you pull and you don't get the, your nonce back, then you have been completely forked from the history, and you could uh, safely go to IRC or to the mailing list and complain that someone, someone is equivocating. So it seems that you assume uh, in the scenario, you assume there is a channel, communication, communication channel between Alice and Bob. Um, sorry, I couldn't understand that. Can you repeat, please? I mean, do you assume there is a communication channel between Alice and Bob directly without going through the repo? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, as far as I know, that's a realistic assumption. I, I haven't worked on being in any project in which they don't even have, like, a Google group. Let's thank the speaker again.